Good morning and happy Sabbath, Church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It's great to see you all uh, again in the Zoom platform today. We are having the Temperance Weekend and the weekend theme is Beautiful Inside Out. A speaker for today is going to be Dr. Jacob Chindripu. Imagine that a fashion designer asks you or, or tells you, gives you a suggestion of what to wear, what not to wear, and how to accessorize. How would you feel about it? I'm sure I would feel very great because I would like to uh, appear good. There's nothing wrong with wanting an attractive appearance, but real beauty is in something we put on. It's given to us by Christ who makes us holy. We will now enter into the worship time uh, for which I would like to welcome uh, Sister Melody Martin to lead out with a song service. Let's sing uh, hymn number 511. I know whom I have believed. Five one one. Thank you, uh, um, Saroka and family, for leading off with the song service. Uh, we will have a welcome given to us by Dr. Bueller. 
You're on mute, Dr. Gila. Good afternoon and happy Sabbath to each one of you. It is indeed a joy and a privilege for our family to be able to join with you all in worship this uh, afternoon. I hope you are being blessed by the uh, presentation uh, during this temperance weekend. If you have your Bibles, kindly turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 to 27. It says, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Uh, we as God's children have the privilege and honor of being the bride of Christ. Uh, so may we all live up to this high calling, the calling to present ourselves as a church without having spot, wrinkle, or blemish. It's my prayer as we worship God. I would like to welcome each and every one of you who have joined for worship today. Shall we pray? Mighty God in heaven, what a privilege it is for your children to gather together in thy holy name to worship and praise you and to adore you and to listen to your voice. I pray God as we worship you, accept us just as we are your children and teach us to live a life that is acceptable in your sight, O oh Father. Fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit as we listen to your voice, that we will turn towards Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. For I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Eula and Dr. Jacob for that welcome and uh, uh, invocation. Uh, we will now hear the opening song, which will be led to us by Sister Angela Chintupu. For our opening song this morning, we will sing song number 152, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Story most precious, sweet as that. 
thank you, Angel Angela, for that opening song. Uh, we will have the Tights and Beat uh, offering video played first, followed by the special song by Pastor Aaron Jeshurin and Sister Saroja Martin. Pastor Pavel and Valentina decide what can we learn from their story today that will help us put God first in our own lives. Pastor Pavel and Valentina were responsible to serve a house church that required them to go over a scary trek of nine miles to get there. This risky trip made them tired and hungry, but it was impossible to find bread on store shelves in Sukumi, capital of Georgia's breakaway region of Abkhazia. It was 1993 during an armed conflict between Georgian and Abkhaz forces that resulted in a major food shortage. There were few bakeries selling bread at night, but they were always sold out every time Valentina dared to make the risky trip. One day after the worship service, Maya, a church member, offered Valentina some bread, but she refused to accept it. Maya, with a generous heart, insisted and cried. So Valentina divided the loaf into two, half for her and half for Maya. Valentina and her husband were happy since they had not eaten bread for over six months. She was thinking of eating it with barley soup. On their way back home, they met an old, thin, and filthy woman begging for food, saying she was starving to death. Valentina remembered the joy Maya had experienced when she had shared the bread with her. Would they have the courage to share their blessing as well, even in such a difficult situation? Valentina then opened her bag and shared the half loaf they had, and the old lady accepted in tears of joy. Valentina and Pavel continued on their way home with a joyful smile on their faces. This small and unique experience was greater than their hunger. Sometimes putting God first involves sharing what you have with others, even when resources are hard to come by. Pastor Pavel and Valentina put God first despite the sacrifice. Their courage inspires us today. Jesus gave up everything to redeem us, and His love compels us to put His kingdom first in our own lives. As we return the tithe and our promise offering, we are challenged to put God first. Can we have the special song by uh, Sister Saroja Martin and Pastor Aaron, please? Padulisanakarium 
the act of surrender enables us to be us to be brought into a personal relationship with the God and experience His amazing love. When we mm -hmm. under when we understand His love, our gra gratitude motivates us to show our appreciation and it gives us an incredible desire to do even more of for our, for our Lord and Savior. We need to thank God, to thank God daily for his deep and abiding love if it were not for Calvary, where Jesus paid to his the ultimate price for, for our sins. Our eternal life would not be possible. He gave his wing not because we deserved it, but, but because of his unfathomable. Unf unf Unfathomable and unending, unending, amazing love for us. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. Thank you for that message and uh, uh, in in the thought that you read, uh, Benjamin. We will hear the response. Uh, of the song Spirit of the Living God, followed by which uh, I request Sister Mahendra Martin to do the pastoral prayer. We will hear the response first and then the prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for this privilege of prayer. Thank you for being with us through the past week and making it possible for all of us who have congregated here online to come together to worship and offer our prayers to you. All that you have created and made was perfect then sin entered. The effects of sin are now equally seen in all that is in front of us. 
but amidst it all, true beauty has always been something that comes from within and never outward and physical. You are a lover of the beautiful, beautiful in heart, mind, body, and soul. In your eyes, it is the inner beauty that matters the most. And so today, Lord, we thank you for all that you continually do for us, making our lives beautiful in spite of the difficulties that come our way, in spite of the trials of life that sprinkle themselves on life's journey, in spite of the challenges on the Christian journey. We pray for each child of yours, bow down in your presence. We pray for the sick, the suffering. We pray that you would touch them and heal them from their suffering. We pray for those amongst us who are weak, physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, financially, and emotionally. In every aspect of our lives, we pray that you would be with us. We pray for the guest who may be with us, and we ask that you bless them of their heart's desires. Be with every child who has an unspoken prayer, unspoken request. We pray for the pastor and eldership of this church. We pray that you would grant them the wisdom that they need to deal with all aspects of the church in a systematic and diligent manner, approval to use. We thank you for the life of Dr. Chindripu. We thank you for the many lives that he touches through his ministry. As his family take us through this weekend of temperance, we pray that you would bless them and grant them the good health and strength that they need. Once again, O oh Lord, we commit all that we have to you above all ourselves. We pray that you would dwell amongst us and bless us with your presence on your Sabbath day. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. For that pastoral prayer. Uh, we will now hear the scripture reading and that will be read to us by Melody Martin. For, for our scripture reading, let us turn our Bible to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. <clears throat> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, 
temperance. Against such there is no law. Amen. Thank you, Melody, for that two verses. Uh, we have a special song, and it will be presented to us by Dr. Daniel John. Sabbath with Wasi Church. Uh, my name is Daniel, and uh, uh, I'm glad to be a part of you today. Uh, the song that we're going to sing is uh, called Your Grace Still Amazes Me. And uh, may you listen to the words of the song and be blessed this morning. Uh, with me, I have uh, Antonella from Chile, and, and I have Mika from Wildwood uh, in Georgia, USA.
Thank you, Dr. Daniel John and his friends for that special song of Your Grace Amazes Me. Um, we will now enter into the next part of our program, which is the sermon. The speaker of the hour is Dr. Jacob Shinjipu. He's not uh, new to the Wallasey Church, and he's, he's become more than a family now because he's here most of the week and he's dealing with the temperance uh, series for our AY uh, department. We're glad that Dr. Jacob is here with us. And as you all know, this weekend is a special weekend. It's a temperance weekend and the theme for the weekend is beautiful inside out. Over to you, Dr. Jacob Chinjipu. What a privilege it is to worship with God's people once again. We are so delighted. And I'm sure you two are delighted. Lesa Nakaryam actually made you more delighted. Am I right? I saw the smiles of everyone, whether you understand or not. I'm sure the Lord has spoken to us. Nothing is too hard for our God. Like how we created the earth and the universe. Leta Anakaryam. And your grace still amazes, amazes me. Have you asked this question to Jesus? How come, oh God? David says, when I look at the heavens, the moon and the stars, and the work of your hands, what is man? What am I that you are so mindful of him? I pray as we celebrate this temperance weekend, perhaps many times when we listen to temperance messages, we always heard what to eat, what not to eat, what to drink, what not to drink, how to wear, and all those things. But this weekend, we've decided that we on Friday would dwell on mental health, which is so vital to our spiritual growth. For there's a connection between the mind and the body. Unless the mind is willing, the flesh could be weak. And therefore, we were trying to connect between the mind and the body and our spiritual health. And so this Sabbath afternoon, it is our privilege to continue. We have been studying through the year on temperance, but this weekend, it is going to be a little different. We studied yesterday on the mind and the mental health. And on this Sabbath, this afternoon, we will study the spiritual health that is so vital for us to drive our physical life. Shall we pray? Mighty God, please, I pray this afternoon, you speak to our hearts, O oh Father. Touch our hearts and mind as it was offered in the pastoral prayer that you are a God of beauty. And you want us to be beautiful inside out, oh Father. And so I pray that you will speak to our hearts, that we will turn towards Jesus, who is the beauty, who is the author of beauty, who is so beautiful. But I pray all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Chris Rose, a real estate agent, spent about six months showing to one couple homes a home that this couple was planning to reside in. After inspecting several homes, finally, this couple decided two homes, one, the first one, and the second one. The wife went to, to make the final choice for this first home, but it was their first choice. And as she was about to make this final choice to, to stay, which is going to be their resting home. Quickly, this woman changed her mind and said to the, the said to Chris Rose, I want the other house. And, and Chris asked, What is the reason that you are changing your mind? And this beautiful, wonderful woman said, 
I was standing there. I was standing there in the living room and I sent out an SOS to my almighty God. God, show me a sign if I have to choose this home as our resting home. Right then and there, a plane came zooming right on its flight path to the airport. And I knew that that wasn't the house for us. Decisions and choices are made more often based on signs and appearances. So it does work with us most of the times, my brothers and sisters, with God, it is not so. God bases his decision and not what he sees on the external, not what he sees on the surface. God makes decision based on his penetrating gaze, searching deep within, inside out. When God chooses, he gazes into the depths of our hearts, my brothers and sisters. When God chose David to be the king of the children of Israelites, he, God, demonstrated that beauty is from the inside out. God told Samuel to go to Bethlehem and there he told Samuel, choose one of Jesse's sons as the next king of Israel. And so Samuel went to Bethlehem, went to Jesse's home, and he began the prophetic inspection. Samuel looked over to Jesse's sons, one by one, and the word of God says, and thought he, he looked at Eliab and said to himself, this Eliab must be the chosen future king of Israel. How did Samuel come to such a conclusion saying that Eliab is the chosen future king of Israel? Samuel looked upon Eliab because Eliab looked like Saul in height and in looks and in stature. And as Samuel looked upon his princely bearing, he thought this indeed is the man. This indeed is the man whom God has chosen as the successor to Saul. And therefore, after Samuel made his choice and decision, he waited upon the divine sanction that he might anoint the king. But Jehovah did not, I mark, please mark this verse, but Jehovah did not look upon the outward appearance, my brothers. Eliab, whom Samuel was choosing, did not fear the Lord, had been called, had only Eliab been called to the throne, he would have been a proud king, he would have been an extracting ruler. Therefore, the Lord rejected him. The Lord's words came to Samuel. Lord's word came back to Samuel. And, it, and when it came to pass, but the Lord said unto Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because the word of God says, I have refused him. 
for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man seeth the beauty of an individual. He sees the height thereof. Man looks at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks into the heart. God said no to just these sons. Until David, the lonely shepherd, was brought in. You know why? Why God had to refuse the rest of the brothers? The answerees at Simple. The Lord looks at the heart, my brothers and sisters. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the inner man, the inside. So beauty has always been something that isn't outward. It isn't physical. It has always been the inner self. It is the character, the beauty from the inside out. Well, it doesn't imply all that is beautiful and all that is attractive is undesirable or unacceptable. God is a lover of the beautiful. He has placed more value on the inner life, on the hidden man, the hidden man of the heart, on the character that is priceless. In the eyes of God, inner beauty matters more than the outer beauty. For this kind of beauty shines brightly for all to see and impacts all those around us. This inner beauty not only impacts our life, but impacts others around us. Ellen White says, no outward beauty can recommend a soul to God. No external beauty can recommend a soul to God. The wisdom and excellence revealed in the character and deportment expresses the true beauty of the man. And it is the inner worth, the excellency of the heart that determines our acceptance with the Lord of hosts. Oh, brother and sister, this is profound. Nothing of the inter internal form can recommend us to God. Mark this, brothers and sisters. So how deeply should we feel this truth in the judgment of others and ourselves, my friend? We must learn from the mistake of Saul of how vain is the estimation that rests on the beauty of face or nobility of stature. Man is incapable. His knowledge and wisdom is limited and it has his limited understanding. The secret of man's heart and only the counsels of God without special enlightenment from the heaven, it is impossible for us to discern man's heart. On the contrary, many life and character that spell doom and hopelessness have been changed to usefulness and good prospects when they came close to Jesus. Christ sees our possibilities, brothers and sisters. Christ sees your possibility. Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner, but Christ knew the circumstances that shaped Mary's life. When to human eyes, her case appeared hopeless, but Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. In the, in the one fallen and possessed by demons, Christ's grace and forgiveness wrought a marvelous transformation. Oh, if only we could see through the eyes of Jesus how many souls would have been saved and brought to the cross of Calvary, my friends. Oh, how if only we could see through the eyes of Jesus inside out 
how unlike samuel we can avoid much error in our judgment and the estimation of character beauty is one of our values isn't it everyone wants to be beautiful everyone wants to be handsome how many of you took time this morning to look good when you came to church what is true beauty my brothers and sisters my young friends where does true beauty come from true beauty is from the inside out did you know god our god my god jesus is called beautiful one thing david is saying in psalms 27:4 one thing i ask of the lord and this only do i seek only this one thing i seek from god that i may dwell in the house of the lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the lord and to seek him in his temple oh my friends david is aspiring david is desiring that he wants to see the beauty of jesus by beholding him so that he would become like jesus have you thought about this jesus is beautiful and if you contemplate on his beauty by beholding him we will become beautiful why does david call god beautiful he has he seen god certainly not but david has tasted god's lovely attributes he has experienced god's character he has tasted god's love he has experienced god's care and mercy therefore david called jesus beautiful the question i have for you have you seen god's beauty my brothers you know his character and his love for you if not take time this week to see the beauty of god's holiness study his character the more you look to jesus the more you look to jesus the less you will think of your own self before the looking mirror came into existence probably you must know this the only way one could look look upon their image was most likely in water they could only could look upon their image in water a still pond was perhaps the best way to see themselves clearly but for most people that was always not possible a moving river or a moving stream or perhaps some kind of shiny object provided the best opportunity to see what they looked like and then what they saw their reflection was mostly a, a bit distorted so no one put much thought in what they saw it wasn't a big deal it wasn't a big issue even even if they saw a distorted image of their themselves so people then looked more into their inner self than to their exterior but all this has changed in a big way around the year 1500 when the looking mirror began to be mass produced and made available to large numbers of people this was the beginning of a grave great shift in the history of self this was the greatest shift that took place in the history of self understanding and thus began the era in which we live today shaped by hollywood and madison avenue so my brothers and sisters we no longer live from the inside out we live from the outside in what we see in the mirror defines who we are really is that so we compare what we see in the mirror with the images all around us we compare ourselves with the images all around us and then we begin to judge ourselves our values and our sense of what based on the externals 
uh, we begin to judge ourselves based on these superficial things. We look into the mirror and ask, am I attractive? Am I gaining weight? Do I look good? Is that a gray hair in my, in my, in my head? Are my clothes in style? Sadly, we have become captives of the looking glass. And so every morning when we get up and look into the mirror, we are judged. We are judged by an external and superficial world. And if you are like me, the first thing you see is every single flaw in yourself. So it is when we see in the spiritual mirror, my brothers and sisters, we can see every flaw, every inadequacy, and, if, and we are afraid, afraid that we are not filling in and exposed as being all too human. But Jeremy exhorts in the 31st chapter, verse 31 to 34, behold, the days have come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband man unto them, said the Lord, for well, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After, I, after those days, said the Lord, I will put my law. Where? Where does God want to put his law in their inward parts and write them in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. That was God's desire. When our sins are forgiven and when we accept his grace and the working of the Holy Spirit, then we will possess that unfading beauty, that inward beauty that will never end, never go out of date, or will never go out of fashion. This inner beauty has its adorning. Can anyone guess what is that that adorns our inner soul? You will find it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 20, 22 to 23. The fruits of the Spirit that adorn the soul does not come naturally, friends. It involves a hard battle against self. But like a, a lighthouse on a dark and stormy night, it sheds its light all around us. This is how holy men and women of old used to adorn themselves and were known for generations as men and women who possessed unfading inner beauty, a kind of beauty that doesn't depend on cosmetics or plastic surgery because it is not external. Let us now take a closer look at one of the well-known biblical characters who was beautiful inside out. The word of God says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. And Joseph is the one who exhibited the fruits of the spirit. Joseph is an amazing example. The kind of story that dreams are built on after many unexpected twists and turns and 13 years of toil and affliction, God bless Joseph in an an amazing, unimaginable way. Do you know why? Joseph was a man of principle. Joseph was a man of principle. Next to Jesus, Joseph could be considered as the greatest example of godly character and integrity, my brothers and sisters. In the house of Potiphar, Joseph's gentleness and fidelity won the heart of his master who came to regard him as a son rather than a slave, recognizing that God's favor and presence was with Joseph. 
Potiphar soon appointed him manager over his entire house. Genesis 39, six days. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hands. And he knew not what ought he had in his own except the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person. I was, I, I, I was traveling uh, many years ago and I, and I saw an epitaph written on the grave. No name, nothing was written. It was simply written, good man. What a, an epitaph written. Joseph here is a goodly person, says the word of God and a well-favored man. It is recorded in the word of God. Joseph was beautiful inside out according to the story. However, Joseph's integrity needed testing. Joseph needed to be tested if he was a good man. When Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph, he did not fall for it. No matter what the cost was, he reasoned to himself in Genesis 39 chapter, verse nine says, how can I do this? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God was the question Joseph asked to himself. His main concern was what God would think about this. How about you, my brothers and sisters, when such temptations, when we are beset with such temptations like Joseph? Have you thought of God first? Joseph's faithful integrity led to the loss of his reputation and his liberty. He suffered for his tempter, revenged herself by accusing him of a foul crime and thrust him into prison. But he had the peace that comes from conscious innocence and he trusted his case with God. And not only that, my brothers, Joseph didn't sit idle while he was in the prison. He found work to do in the prison. Even in the prison, he was witnessing for his father in heaven. He kept his temper sweet and his sympathy warm and strong despite trials and hardships. He submitted to God's discipline and learned the lessons of justice lessons of sympathy and mercy that prepared him for greater trust and greater honor. He was a blessing not only to the people of Egypt, but to other nations connected with that powerful kingdom, my friends. He was a light bearer. He was a light bearer of truth and was placed next to the throne of the world's greatest empire. Amazing, isn't it? From pit to prison, and from prison to Potiphar, and from Potiphar to be the prime minister, from slave to your master. Joseph's journey is remarkable because of the presence of God, which was with him. God was with him. His true beauty, though cost him prison and punishment, eventually gained for him a name that will never be forgotten in the history, my brothers and sisters. The fruits of the spirit, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering, self-control blossomed. The long years of toil, the long years of suffering and strict discipline fetched for him the crown of life. Through all this, one thing remained unchanged all these years through his character, his heart, his faithfulness to God and his faithfulness to man has never changed. The beauty of his noble character shines like a lighthouse amidst a raging storm that sheds its beam far across the ocean in the darkness of a starlit night, guiding many a shore. The Lord was with Joseph. As a result, his life was a blessing to many. 
to his master, to his prison mates, to his family, to the whole land of Egypt and to his distant homeland. Have you ever wondered, my friends, what enabled Joseph to make such a record firmness of character, uprightness and wisdom? Ellen White wrote in her book, Patriots and Prophets, in, his, in Joseph's early years, he had consulted duty rather than inclination. In his early years, he had consulted duty rather than inclination. A pure and simple life had favored the vigorous development of both physical and intellectual powers. Faithful attention to duty in every circumstances, in every duty station, from the lowliest of the, to the most exalted had been training every power for its highest service. He who lives in accordance with the creator's will in securing to himself the truest and the noblest development of character. What a beautiful character Joseph possessed. Joseph's status kept changing. He went from favorite son to favorite slave to favorite executive and even a favorite prisoner. To wrap it all, Joseph was faithful inside out, made it through the worst of situation because of the following reasons. Number one, he kept duty above inclination or feelings. Number two, his life was pure and simple, a fertile ground for the development of mind and character. His mind was pure and simple for the development of mind and character. Faithfulness in little things. Joseph was faithful in small things. And above all, Joseph followed God's will. Joseph was exposed to temptations of no ordinary character in Egypt. The sights and the sounds of vice were all around him, but he was one who saw and heard not. How about my brothers and sisters? How about you and how about me? Do we bend with the wind, flattering ourselves that we need to be flexible and adaptable to the society we live in, to the customs that comes on our way. Are we like Joseph when surrounded by evil, keep pure like the water lily growing in brackish waters? Did Joseph miss his home? Was he homesick and craved for company? Did boredom drive him crazy during those lonely years in prison? What thoughts ran through his mind? The pen of inspiration, Ellen White says in her writings, his thoughts were not permitted to linger upon forbidden subjects. His thoughts were not permitted to linger upon forbidden subjects. This, my brothers and sisters, was the secret behind his firmness and integrity of character. Joseph had no time for daydreaming, pleasure or amusement. His life was one of active labor and usefulness. He spent no idle moment in nostalgic memories. He lived to bless others and his thoughtfulness, sympathy and honesty added further charm to his pleasing exterior. His nobility of character shone through both prosperity and adversity. Can you and I like Joseph become fruitful in rejection? to become fruitful through false accusation and become fruitful through being forgotten. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, no matter how hard you try it. So it is with godliness. A godly character shines from within out and shines the brightest during the toughest situation and darkest 
experience. A visiting preacher one was attending a man's breakfast in a farm country. He asked one of the farmers, one of the senior farmers to say grace. But all were seated. The oldest farmer began, Lord, he began his prayer and said, Lord, I hate buttermilk. The preacher was shocked and surprised and opened one of his eyes and wondered himself where this was all going to lead. And so the farmer continued, Lord, I hate Lord. Now the preacher was worried. However, without missing a beat, the farmer prayed on and Lord, you know, I don't care much of the raw white flour. The preacher could not bear no longer and he was moving towards the, the farmer to make, to, in order to ask him to stop praying. And but the farmer continued, but Lord, when you mix them all together, when you mix the buttermilk, when you mix the butter, when you mix the flour, when you mix the lard together and bake them up, I do love those fresh and tasty biscuits. So Lord, when things come up, we don't like, when things have appearing that we do not like, when life gets hard, when we just don't understand what you're saying to us, we just need to relax and wait till you're done mixing and probably it will be something all that you're going to do in our lives something more than more better than the fresh biscuits and the farmer said amen what a prayer of faith amazing isn't it being faithful inside out not only takes purity not only takes courage faithfulness determination but also endurance and suffering. The inner beauty or inner worth of a person lies in the ability to make lemonade when life offers them lemons. It is so tempting to become weary or impatient and abandon the vision for an easier way when assailed with temptations, injustice, and false accusations like Joseph who experienced, but take Friends, take heart. Don't become weary in well-doing. Like Joseph, in due time, we will reap the reward. Galatians 6, 9 says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, we, you and I, shall reap if we faint not. The story of Joseph, a life well-lived, is an inspiration and motivation to thousands down the ages. And I believe that this example, the example of Joseph will change, will inspire and help us to develop the character of our young people seated there. This morning, this afternoon, I want you to look at another admirable character. We just finished studying about Moses, whose life proves that it is never too late to do great things for God. Moses was a goodly child to look upon. And his mother, Jacob, sensing that he knew his newborn, her newborn child was destined for a higher purpose, determined to save him against all odds. Little did she realize then that the cherub child, she gave up. That day would be returned to her for training and instruction. The mother of Moses was instrumental in instilling good morals, good moral values, high standards, and the fear of God, all of which go a long way in the making of a hero, in the making of a leader who is beautiful inside out. Hebrews 11, 25 29, to 29 says, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What a, what a testimony, what a testimony about Moses. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, lest he had destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through, through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do for drowning. 
these verses are a testament to the sacrifice and the magnanimity of Moses. We studied today, he was a replica of Jesus. Moses refused what likely would have been a lifetime of luxury. Ellen White says, and Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And yet he did not care about his royal background or his education. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Acts, the seventh, seventh chapter, verse 24 says, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. Moses was filled with pity. Moses was filled with sympathy and a righteous indignation at the injustice was, that was meted to his brother. A rare attribute that shines out through this hardened exterior. And so Moses ends up leaving Egypt to Midian and continued to suffer affliction. Thus did Moses esteem the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Moses, from crown prince of the then richest empire in the world, to a fugitive in the wilds of Midian, spent 40 years as a keeper of the sheep instead of being the king, the future leader of Israel, subject to the strictest discipline and harshness in the harshness of the desert, bore fruit after how long? After another 40 years, where did he reap the, the fruits? Not in the prestigious institutions of Egypt. He did not receive where he received his training, but in the lonely, scorching desert, he was there. A beautiful character, my brothers and sisters, is not the result of accident. Neither can it happen overnight. Many may acquire knowledge possible to be imparted by the human teacher. Ellen White says, but there is still greater wisdom required of them by God. Like Moses, they must learn meekness. Like Moses, they must learn lowliness of heart and distrust of self. A patient Moses was finally ready to bear fruit after 40 long years. Luke 8 chapter verse 15 says, but not on the ground are they which in the honest and good heart, having heard the word, kept it and bring forth fruit with patience. Moses was a meek man. Moses was a patient man. Moses, an epitome of patience and meekness, bore fruit in God's timing. You know why? Because he submitted to God's discipline. By submitting to God's discipline, Moses became a sanctified channel through which the Lord could work. He did not hesitate to change his way for the Lord's way, even though it did lead in strange paths, in untried ways. Moses was honored of all men as the meekest man on earth. The word of God says, Numbers 12, 3. Now the man of Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Remember, friends, Moses was meek, but he was not weak. So should we be, my brothers and sisters, meek yet uncompromising. Meekness is a trait every Christian should aim for and seek to possess because in the word of God, Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 15 says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. And also meekness is one of the fruits of the spirit. Meekness, temperance against such, there is no law. We too, in a certain sense, are like Moses. When led by God, we do not see God's face 
only his back because we see his footprints and remember what he has done in the past we like moses should not be anxious apprehensive or afraid to follow his path and the fact that god called moses when he was 80 years old to become the leader of his people teaches that god's time table and timing is different from ours and also the life of moses reminds us that we are never too old to serve god i know for sure some of you are never too old to serve god we should be available any time for he will make us and our possibility is possible for his kingdom to be a lovable and a loving christian filled with the beauty of his graces we need to come and the pruning knife for moses and joseph the road to success was not easy looking to jesus will ease the pain look steadfastly unto jesus that you may catch his spirit and cherish the qualities of a christ christ like character then it will be recognized by all who have any connection with you my brothers and sisters that you have learned of christ his meekness his affection his tenderness and his sympathy while living from the inside out in an outside world is not easy and we can be easily distracted the mirror has a way of teaching out and pulling us in i'm sure all of us looked into the mirror this morning but how many of us looked deeply into our hearts this morning with god's help let us earnestly strive to overcome the spots in our character which the spiritual mirror alone can reveal to us may we all climb the extra step make that extra effort each day to perfect our character each day that we may present blameless in the sight of a holy god i pray that every every one of us that the eyes of our hearts be truly opened up that we might see god in faith reach out to him and believe that he is capable to make us beautiful from inside out may this be one experience and my prayer for each of one of you today bani j crosby the greatest hymn writer of the 19th century wrote many songs some of which we still sing today in our churches when she was in her 80s one of her friends asked how long she was going to continue her vigorous writing activity hymn writing activity she replied how long i am going to travel and lecture always i will continue my hymn writing there is nothing that could induce me to abandon my work it means nothing to be 84 years of age because i am still young isn't it amazing my friends perhaps fanny de crosby was referring to that unfading inner beauty of a submissive and humble spirit perhaps she was referring to the unceasing charm of a heart adorned with the precious fruits of the spirit when she boldly declared i'm still young isaiah 40 31 says they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint how wonderful is the thought my friends those who wait upon the lord will be partakers of that eternal youth and will possess the charm of an everlasting character polished after the divine similitude which is beautiful from inside out so let us not rest until we are like moses let us not rest until we are like joseph like david and a host of other champions of faith shine and reflect the beauty of jesus drawing others to him is my prayer for you and for me today the coming of jesus is nigh and therefore all the more reason for us to live life inside out god bless you god bless you my brothers and sisters till we attain that life 
that beautiful life of inside out. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Jacob, for bringing to us such a powerful message today. Thank you for reminding us through biblical characters that we need to have a makeover, not the physical ones, but a divine makeover, which only our God can give us to walk in God's way. We pray that God would bless you and your family as you do his uh, ministry. Thank you, Dr. Jacob and family once again. Um, May I request Angela Chindripu to do the closing song? I feel quite sure if I did my best I could maybe impress you With tender words and no harmony A clever rhyme or two But if all I've done in the time we've shared Is turn your eyes on me then I feel that what I've been called to do There's someone else I want you to see Will you love Jesus more? When we go our separate ways When this moment is a memory Will you remember his face? Will you look back and realize You've sensed his love more than you have did before? I'd pray for nothing less Than for you to love Jesus more I'd like to keep these memories in frames of gold and silver and reminisce a year from now about the smiles we've shared. But above all else, I hope you will come to know the fun when you see the Lord face to face, you hear him say, well done. Will you love Jesus more? When we go our separate ways, when this moment is a memory,
pray for nothing less than for you to love Jesus Amen. Shall we, shall we close our eyes in prayer? Mighty God, we thank and praise you, Father, for speaking to our hearts today. As we continue our lives in this world, our Father, help us to, to be able to live a life, beautiful life, inside out, that is not only going to be a blessing to us, but blessing to the people and the communities that we live in. God, we are waiting for your soon return and it's all the more reason for us to live a beautiful life inside out so that many more will see the beauty of Jesus, the character of Jesus in our lives and they will be drawn towards you. Fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit of Father that we will be living lives like Jesus till you shall come back to take us home. Until then, may we be beautiful people living beautiful lives living inside out. Until then, for I pray all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.